And it's my great pleasure to welcome you. Yeah, I'm building up. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the fifth uh, London Review of International Law annual lecture, jointly supported by the LIC, uh, SOAS, and by our friends at Oxford University Press, represented here by um, Grace uh, Ranola. Uh, I'd like to begin also by um, thanking Simone Davies for helping to organize the lecture. Thanks, Simone. So previous lectures um, have been delivered by, amongst others, uh, Stuart Eldon, Judith Butler, and Sheila Jasanov. Uh, it says something about uh, the inclinations of the journal and of the lecture uh, itself that these lecturers were respectively a professor of geography, a professor of comparative literature, and a professor of science and technology studies. Indeed, um, as of 8 p.m. this evening, professors of comparative literature will have delivered twice as many lectures in this series as lecturers in international law. Is there a London Review of Comparative Literature? One finds oneself asking. Um, if there is, perhaps international lawyers should be delivering its annual lectures. But the fact is, the London Review of International Law, and here I acknowledge my fellow editors, uh, Matt Craven, Tor Craver, uh, Susan Marks, Stephen Humphreys, and Katrina Drew, as, as well as Andrew Lang, who can't be with us today, is a journal uh, dedicated to what we might think of as an indirect approach to uh, international law, or uh, maybe better, a direct approach to many different international laws found in many different places in engineering projects of the 17th century, in the work of unofficial tribunals, in the Harlem of Malcolm X, in the visit of a famous philosopher to post-dictatorship uh, Argentina in 1985, just to choose at random uh, the four leading essays from last year's uh, last issue in 2017. To call this uh, interdisciplinary would be uh, a defeat, uh, I think. This is a journal dedicated to the super-disciplinary or the anti-disciplinary or the non-disciplinary. We're seriously proud uh, to publish work of such variety and daring, which almost brings me to Professor Slaughter. But first, let me just say two things. One is that we're being filmed, so please bear, in this, bear this in mind when you ask your short, punchy questions uh, at the end of this presentation. And secondly, we hold this lecture in the midst of industrial action by the university and college union. The LSE is not on strike, but we want to recognize the efforts of our striking colleagues at the University of London and elsewhere this evening. Yay. Well, we're delighted to welcome um, Professor Joseph Slaughter to the LSE to deliver this lecture. Professor Slaughter holds a chair in comparative literature, of course, at Columbia University in New York City and was the president between 2016 and 2017 of the American Comparative Literature Association, as well as being on the editorial board of the journal Humanity. Professor Slaughter has been a pioneering spirit in the field of law, literature, and the socio-cultural history of the global south. And many of you will have read his prize-winning book, Human Rights, Inc., The World Novel, Narrative Form, and International Law, an invigorating counterblast against the routines of law and literature. This was law and literature, but not of the Dickens Kafka variety, but of writers like Kamara Lai and Calixte Biala and her attack on what she called, the, or what you call, the white humanitarian reading classes, a delicious phrase. Later work has been attentive to the vocabularies and voice of the human rights movement. Forthcoming work includes a monograph entitled Pathetic Fallacies, Essays on Human Rights, uh, Humanitarianism, and the Humanities, of which this lecture may or may not form a part. Um, a famous writer once was once asked what his novel was about. He pointed at a copy of the novel and said, it's about this. Um, so any characterizations of 
Joey's work, uh, I think, are bound to be uh, mischaracterizations. So, in response to the question, what sort of work does Joey do, the answer is he does what he is about to do this <laughs> evening. Thanks, Joey. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, I appreciate the, the fact that you can't figure out how to say what it is I do because I can't figure it out either. Um, so hopefully this will be an example of that. Um, I want to thank the, the London Review of International Law very much for this, uh, this invitation. It's a real honor to be here um, and to be, to, to be asked to deliver this lecture. The editorial board, Matt Craven, Tor Crever, um, Susan Marks, Stephen, hum Stephen Humphreys, and Katriana Drew. Uh, and I also want to thank Simone Davies for, Davies for the assistance with um, pulling off the logistics of this. I'm going to jump in because I do want to make sure that we have time for some conversation and questions after this, so I will just go ahead and get started. Outside a Yoruba town in 1889, Major Claude MacDonald described standing on the edge of some cliffs four extraordinary looking figures flapping their wings gently backwards and forwards. They were too solid for birds and yet they did not seem to be human beings, they record. The Major summoned the strange figures for an interview despite his, natives gu his native guide's warning that they are spirits returned from the dead. This anecdote appears in the official record in Captain Mockler Ferryman's account up the Niger under the tantalizing heading, Photographing Ghosts. That title is ultimately misleading, however, since the British agents, not being very superstitious themselves, conclude that these imaginary ghosts were ordinary human beings sewn up in cloth, concealing every particle of their person. These apparitions, the major learns later, are an institution maintained by the priesthood. It is their duty to collect food for the priests, and should any native offend, they are the means for their destruction. The ghosts, then, are more like Major MacDonald than he can contemplate. Since both parties, these dead return to life, and the major, who some, some natives said had dropped from heaven, are on missions to, to enforce the laws of their respective otherworldly realms. They meet, that is, in the form of other people's persons. MacDonald was sent by the British government to investigate complaints that the Royal Niger Company, then the sovereign authority in southern Nigeria, was exceeding the powers vested in it by its charter. In accordance with international legal agreements, such as the General Act of the Conference of the Treaty of Berlin from 1885, British colonial corporations in Africa, like others, were vested with responsibility for increasing the moral and material well-being of the indigenous populations, striving for the suppression of slavery, and guaranteeing things like liberty of conscience and religious toleration. Along with rhetorical commitments to free trade, as Matt Craven has shown, these were the, humani these were the humanitarian alibis of charter company colonialism in the scramble for Africa. The 1886 charter of the Royal Niger Company formalized these civilizing obligations while further granting the company all rights, interests, authorities, and powers for the purposes of government, preservation of public order, and protection of the said territories. Through these charters, colonial companies acquired the character of what John Westlake described as mediate territorial sovereigns in his 1894 study chapters on the principles of international law. With rights of governance, powers, powers to maintain a private army, and the capacity to conclude treaties, these colonial companies enhanced their quasi-sovereignty by acquiring not just territory, but international authority and legal personality through concessions from the natives. For this purpose, the Royal Niger Company had 10 standardized forms for the vast majority of the treaties that it made with the natives of, the low, of lower Nigeria. In nearly all of these fill-in-the-blank treaty, uh, these fill-in-the-blank forms, the natives agree to cede to the company all, all of our territory from blank to blank with all sovereign rights to grant monopoly mining and other resource rights and the power to exclude all or any foreigners from our country. And in turn, the company agrees to govern on the basis of the native laws, not to interfere with private property rights and to pay annually, as the new sovereign, a paltry sum to the former rulers of the country. Thus, through a combination of patents, grants, and native treaties, the colonial charter companies acquired a kind of corporate sovereignty. 
as provisionally independent international legal persons. In an essay entitled However Incompletely Human, I have argued that this combination of sovereignty and international legal personality made colonial charter companies early bearers of international human rights. That is, on the one hand, they were charged with promoting and protecting some of the most basic human rights that we now recognize. And on the other hand, the these companies enjoyed a kind of international legal personality that we now generally regard as one of the hallmarks of the contemporary human rights regime. And they did so long before individual human beings became international legal persons or proper subjects of human rights in their own right. Counterintuitively, perhaps, human beings may be said then to have, have usurped some of the human rights of corporations. Tonight, I want to consider the discursive conditions under which those juridical personalities were produced at the interface between imperial and native languages in what Mary Louise Pratt called the contact zone, where two or more languages interact on unequal terms to create an interlanguage that is not reducible to either mother tongue. Antony Engie and others have shown that international law, like most other modern academic disciplines, including literary studies, developed to manage colonialism and colonial peoples. I want to suggest, however, that some of international law's basic concepts, doctrines, and principles may have been the unexpected byproducts of two or more languages rubbing together at the site of colonial contact the effects of missed linguistic encounters, incomplete communications, and sometimes deliberate mistranslations. I will argue that international law, particularly human rights law, is a form of interlanguage filled with the incomplete meanings and partial intentions of others, of multiple languages and language users, and that some of that interlanguage emerges at the margins of international legal space that traces of those e unequal interlinguistic encounters haunt the law today, and that some of the interlinguistic features of, the, of that law may, therefore, be most clearly legible in literature that was itself produced at, the, at those same interfaces. To explore the texture of this interlanguage, I will trace the concept of juristic persons through a number of unlikely places, poetic passages of legal prose filled with flapping ghosts and fading flowers, before turning to read a number of international legal documents and doctrines alongside and through colonial Nigerian writer Amos Tutuola's first novel, The Palm Wine Drinkard. Major MacDonald's mission was not, of course, to photograph ghosts. It was instead twofold, to ensure that the Royal Niger Company was complying with its charter obligations and to inquire from the various chiefs whether they had made the treaties they were alleged to have made. In other words, MacDonald was checking on the company's compliance with British law on the one hand and with international law on the other. If we accept the idea that the natives had the legal capacity to alienate their lands, resources, and sovereignty, a subject of much debate at the time, then the sovereign international personality of the colonial charter companies was quite literally the discursive creation of so-called savages. However, more than one of the Royal Niger Company's interpreters attested to Major MacDonald that they were not aware of, that ceding meant giving over rights of government, and in no case were the chiefs made to understand that they were giving up their country to the company. Thus, although the treaties may have been worth no more than that of the paper on which they were written, as MacDonald's secretary acknowledged, they nonetheless brought to life paper sovereigns who scrambled about Africa at the end of the 19th century. Cloaked in the standardized language of European international law, these paper sovereigns were hybrid creatures of, peculiar, of, of a peculiar interlanguage. In fact, the scores of native treaties, treaties that were produced created an entire bush of legal creatures, natives, chiefs, kings, sovereign corporations, and others, persons invested with authority to act on behalf of somebody else's sovereignty, that is, as persons for other people. The French sociologist Marcel Mauss might have recognized the uncanny coincidence of all these creatures of law. In 1938, Mauss traced what he called one of the categories of the human mind, the idea of person. According to Mauss, 
Some form of person appears else everywhere, from what he called the primitive societies of the Indians and Aborigines, to the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, to modern law. However, most valorized a Euro-modern moral and legal idea of the person over all of these so-called primitive ones, a transcendent idea of the person that in 1938 he urged his audience to defend against an unnamed threat. From the other side of the Holocaust, we might recognize with, with Roberto Esposito and others, the actualization of that threat, in the, the actualization of that threat to the person in the concentration internment, labor, and death camps of World War II, in the barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind in the words of the pre to the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which sought to reaffirm and to realize what it called the dignity and worth of the human person. Perhaps because some idea of person seems to be everywhere, we tend to overlook it, especially in the humanities, or to confuse the person for some other creature, the citizen, the subject, the individual, the human. The native masks that most set aside as archaic forms of personhood might help to visualize the modern legal idea of person as what Hans Kelsen later called a holder of certain rights and duties that precede the individual, that anticipate the citizen, that await activation in the human. Even as Major MacDonald was following the paper trail of the Royal Niger Company, legal debates about juridic juridical personality, especially that of corporations, raged in the US and the UK. The primary, primary question at the time was whether such legal personality was real or merely artificial. No, it's fine. Legal commentators sought to unpack this basic syllogism. Only persons can be subjects of rights and duties, a corporation is a subject of rights and duties, therefore the corporation is a person. However, the syllogism itself tells us nothing about the nature of the corporation and very little, if anything, about the nature of juridical personality. As such, many analysts often turn to other figures to explore the problem of personhood. So, for example, progressive American legal theorist Gerard Henderson affirmed that there is no reason except the practical one why has someone has once suggested the law should not accord to the last rose of summer a legal right not to be plucked. Henderson's striking floral example appeared in a prize-winning essay about overseas companies in the US with a very dry title. Rights, he insisted, are pure creatures of law, like the persons to whom they belong, and when we speak of something as the subject of rights, we mean only, he wrote, that it has the capacity to enter into legal relations. Thus, the hypothetical right of a last rose of summer not to be plucked is simply, for him, a logical expansion of the principle of legal personification, by which anything might become a right and duty-bearing subject of the law. Of the law. Rather than rehearse the debate about the reality or the artificiality of juridical personality, I want to consider instead the work that something like this little rose does in standing in for the potential of anything to be personified by law. The last rose of summer seems to have been, in fact, a fairly common figure in the Anglophone legal literature, a pet illustration, perhaps a limit case, for scholars theorizing and challenging the legal techniques available to states for regulating corporations, and for debating the problematics and the nature of juridical personality generally. Sometimes the last rose serves to affirm the state's sovereign authority to create, animate, and annihilate legal fictions, the biopolitical power, in Foucault's terms, to make live and let die. And sometimes the flower serves as an illustration of such legal absurdities. The unsighted source of Henderson's proposition was James Lorimer, pro pro professor of public law and the law of nature and nations at the University of Edinburgh. Lorimer wrote in his 1872 treatise, The Institutes of Law, that all men are, e that all men are equal is the first maxim of, maxim of the science of jurisprudence. Nor does this species of equality stop even with the human race. The last rose of summer is not without its rights. In a later edition of the same text, Lorimer revised this claim to suggest that the last rose of summer is entitled to equality before the law. Never, however, does Lorimer say that the rose has a right not to be plucked. 
and it would be surprising if he did, since his own invocation of the last rose of summer surely refers to a poem by the same name, written by the Irish poet Thomas Moore in 1813. In Moore's poem, later a popular song, the rose has no rights at all. Instead, the poet claims the right to pluck the flower in its own best interest, a personified interest that the speaker extrapolates from his own existential loneliness and projects then onto the lone blossom. I'll just read the first two stanzas. Tis the last rose of summer left blooming alone. All her lovely companions are faded and gone. No flower of her kindred, no rosebud is nigh to reflect back her blushes, to give sigh for sigh. I'll not leave thee, thou lone one, to pine on the stem. Since the lovely are sleeping, go sleep thou with them. Thus kindly I scatter thy leaves o'er the bed, where thy mates of the garden lie scentless and dead. I note in passing that if the flower is imagined to have any rights in Moore's poem, it is a very dark freedom of association, the right to join her sisters in death. I'll return to the issue of mortality because like sovereignty, death consistently haunts the category of juridical personality and the poetic act of personification. The last rose of summer is a curious figure for probing the, le the limits of legal reasoning. For one thing, no one would deny the empirical, that is the corporeal existence of a rose. And therefore the rose remains a metaphor, a flowery veil for the corporation which seems not to have a body beneath it in the obvious way that a rose issues from a stem. It is then a metaphor for another metaphor. However, the image of Moore's, Moore's rose in the pages of legal theory speaks to the long-standing traffic between the worlds of literature and law and points toward one aspect of the interlanguage that I will examine. Whether the last rose of summer is imagined as having a right not to be plucked or as entitled to equality before the law or as the orphaned sibling of predeceased sisters, she remains a personification. But in those capacities, she has another quality that bears on the topic of juridical personality, what I will call pronominality. The same year as Marcel Mauss's landmark speech, Alexander Nakam published his dissertation, The Personality Conception of the Legal Entity. The person in Nakam's account is merely a foundation for legal predicates, a pronoun, in other words, through which rights and duties may be attached to another subject by way of an operative verb. As I'll show, personification, legal, literary, or otherwise, has a particular grammar that hinges on the operation of the pronoun. As a term of legal art, person has no necessary relation to the human being since it simply holds the place of something that may be endowed with the capacity to act as a person before the law. Thus, in modern law, generally, person is a pronoun still to be specified. In the particular case of international human rights law, person is the pronominal figure through which the law personifies the human being as a creature capable of bearing its birthrights. Thus, in the beginning, all human beings may be born free and equal in dignity and rights. But to be enjoyed, that birthright dignity must be supplemented by other rights, rights of personhood. So, for example, everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law, and everyone has the, and, excuse me, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person, and everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. Because of this slide from human to person in the text of international law, human rights is something of a misnomer. The Universal Declaration opens with the human being as the titular subject of human rights, but it, and more especially the entire body of law that follows, very quickly shifts focus to the figure of the person as the bearer of human rights, a juridical pronoun whose antecedent appears to be the human. The subtle displacement of the human being by the person all but eliminated the human as such, that is, as a noun, from the corpus of human rights law, a fact perhaps more easily legible in other languages, in Spanish and French. In fact, the human being seems to fade away when its rights are articulated. It disappears behind ambiguous pronouns, passive constructions, and mysterious personifications. With regard to the condition of pronominality, it is not simply that the word person functions as a pronoun in our, in our ordinary speech and articles of law, Rather, person as a category of the mind is itself pronominal, 
standing in for multitudes of theories, philosophies, psychologies, and politics of the subject. Indeed, there are numerous, perhaps innumerable, possible genealogies of the category of person, whose fundamental assumptions and implications are not reducible to a single order of meaning. Although that plurality is often acknowledged, I would argue that one of the problems with recent authoritative accounts of the person and its entanglement with the category of the human by Giorgio Agamben, Roberto Esposito, and others is their tendency to generalize from a single, sometimes false, genealogy. For example, Esposito reads Jacques Maritain's particular Catholic model of personhood back into the Universal Declaration, not only making the historical mistake of confusing Maritain for one of the drafters of the Universal Declaration, but also missing entirely the sense one gleans from reading the actual working papers of the UN Drafting Committee in the mid-1940s, namely that each of the delegates understood the idea of person differently, that each heard a different word that was filled with the historical weight of distinct philosophical, moral, and religious traditions. In short, that each person had some other person in mind. In that regard, person in the Universal Declaration reprised its classical dramatic role as a mask for the human, and a rhetorical feint for not naming the human itself as a question, or maybe as a problem. In the early anthropological literature on Marcel Mauss's primitive peoples, such an attitude towards the invocatory power of powers of language was called superstition, the dance of words undertaken to avoid summoning a potentially unmanageable creature that drives the creation of ambiguous pronouns and other euphemistic circumlo circumlocutions. From this perspective, the international human rights regime might be regarded as a superstitious body of personifying law that is haunted by ghosts, the dead of World War II and the Holocaust, to be sure, but also the phantasmal, image, phantasmal images of the self-same rights-bearing human that the law imagines in the form of the person, a phenomenal figure that awaits the return of its ancestor, its antecedent or antedecedent. So I'll turn to the improbable text of a Nigerian ghost story in order to think about the mythopoetics of the interlanguage of international human rights law. Amos Tutuola's palm wine, The Palm Wine Drinkard and His Dead Palm Wine Tapster in the Dead's Town from 1952 is an epic tale in which the hero navigates a dangerous world of the dead and the undead, of persons who appear and disappear everywhere. Tutuola's literary universe is a world bent out of shape by the colonial encounter, distended and distorted at the interface of an old native language that no longer quite suffices to apprehend the reality of lived experience, and of a new language of colonialism and international commerce that has not yet completely transformed or taken hold of the mental and material landscape. Tutuola's Bush of Ghosts is an adventure in grammar, a world that obeys neither the laws of physics nor the ordinary, ordinary laws of language, spawning an array of unprecedented monsters, as the book's various cover illustrators like to show. This is also a world where ghosts manage to photograph human beings and frame the film negatives for public display on the walls of a dance hall in anticipation of the arrival of the novel's protagonist. There were many images, recalls the palm wine drinkard in his astonishment, and our own were there, were in the center of the hall. But our own images that we saw there resembled us too much and were also white in color. But we were very surprised to meet our, our images there. Perhaps somebody who was focusing us as a photographer had made them, we could not say. The palm wine drinkard tells the story of a professional drinker who had no other work more than to drink palm wine in my life. Forced by the death of his expert palm wine tapster, he undertakes a sobering quest through the bush of ghosts to retrieve his former supplier from the dead's town. The drinkard's adventures begin literally at death's door. Promised information about his tapster's whereabouts by an old man, he could, if he could bring death from his house, the palm wine drinkard goes in search of death. When I reached his, death's house, he was not at home by that time. He was in his yam garden, which was very close to his house, and I met a small rolling drum in his veranda. Then I beat it to death as a sign of salutation, but when he, death, heard the sound of the drum, he said thus, is that man still alive or dead? Then I replied, I am still alive, I and, I am, and I am not a dead man. 
Outwitting Death's many attempts to kill him, the palm wine drinker catches Death in a net and returns to the old man's house, carrying Death on his head. But immediately he heard from me that I had brought Death. He was greatly terrified and raised alarm, and that he thought nobody could go and bring Death from his house. And then he told me to carry him, Death, back to his house at once, and he, old man, hastily went back to his room and started to close all his doors and windows. But before he could close two or three of the windows, I threw down death before his door, and at the same time I threw him down, the net cut into pieces, and death found his way out. So since the day that I had brought death out from his house, he has no permanent place to dwell or stay, and we are hearing his name about in the world. The palm wine drinker's account of death's slipping the net provides an etiological explanation for his appearance everywhere in the world. But death's escape also unleashes a kind of grammatical terror, since any unclarified pronoun might provide ready cover for death. At every turn in the road, the drinker confronts death in one form or another. Death lurks behind everything. In a sense, death becomes the palm wine drinker's eternal antagonist, although we learn in an almost incidental aside that the drinker and his wife are themselves immune to death because they had sold our death to somebody for the sum of 70 pounds, 18 shillings, 6 pence, and lent our fear to somebody as well on interest of 3 pounds, 10 per month. So we did not care about death, and we did not fear again. But if the palm wine drinker does not personally care about death because he has successfully commodified and marketed his own, he is nonetheless forever forced to deal with its disfiguring effects in the world. This episode contains all three of the textual features that I want to consider in relation to the figurative logic of international law and its poetics of the person. The literalization of metaphor, beating a drum to death. Personification, beating a drum to death. And the parenthetic spec specification of ambiguous pronouns, beating a drum to him, death. At first glance, the use of a parenthetic interruption to clarify an unclear pronoun seems redundant. I beat it to death as a sign of salutation. He, death, heard the sound of the drum. If we accept the personification of small d, death, in capital D, death, then the antecedent of the pronominal subject, he, is clear from the context, and the pronoun seems simply beside the point. That something more troubling as a pace becomes apparent when Tutuola includes two third-person figures in a single sentence. He told me to carry him, death, back to his house at once, and he, old man, hastily went back to his room. Here the antecedents remain incompletely determined. Since he no longer simply holds the place of death, he now also holds the place of the old man, who is protected from death, only by the slim difference contained within the unstable third-person pronoun itself. Pronouns in Tutuola's novel tend to be wayward, unreliable, requiring vigilance, lest they change their ways before our eyes and start referring to inappropriate things. It's not only the th ordinary third-person pronouns, he, she, it, that exhibit this behavior, general and even some proper nouns that we ordinarily think of as indicating very specific things come to function as pronouns. The use of the charm was this. It would turn me into a great fire and smoke so that the harmful creatures would be unable to reach the fire. All of them were coming to us, fire, and when they reached the fire, us, the whole of them surrounded it, although they could not do anything to that fire, us. The narrator's pronominal anxiety is partly a consequence of Tutuola's translation into English of the conceptual and grammatical structures of Yoruba, Yoruba, which lacks any morphological inflections and has only one form of a third-person singular pronoun. But it is more than an effect of incommensurate grammars. It is also a linguistic symptom of the chaos of the Tutuolan universe, where everything has a potential pronominal quality. The parenthetic clarification of an indefinite pronoun may be necessary in a world where any given he could be an old man or God or death or something still to be determined. Personal pronouns, wrote the French linguist Emile ben Benveniste, constitute an, empty, an ensemble of empty signs that are non-referential with respect to reality. They refer solely to the reality of the discourse in which they appear. Such pronouns are also called shifters, 
For benveniste, the shifter of the third person pronoun differs from its first and second person counterparts because it completely evades the dialogical regime of interlocution, where the pronouns you and I are exchanged between speakers in, in the ordinary scene of conversation. The third person pronoun may refer to anyone or anything or to no one. In that sense, for benveniste, the third person is literally a non-person that nonetheless conjures the idea of a person who is personified in the image of the human being. This is precisely where the fiction-making capacity of the law originates. Ordinarily, the pronominal third person abides certain grammatical rules that govern its operations. However, the palm wine drinker's adventures with wayward pronouns and wandering subjects show us something about the mad proliferation of meaning and monsters that can occur in the contact zone where an interlanguage has no stabilized grammar. Wanting to preserve what was described at the time as the palm wine drinker's naive and barbaric texture, Faber and Faber published the novel in London with minimal editorial intervention. However, the editors did reduce the pronominal danger by cutting, many of the, by cutting the number of parenthetic clarifications. Thus, death hides even behind the editorial excisions that are no longer visible in the text. From this perspective, Tutuola's novel explores the potentially terrifying gap between pronouns and their reference, the ellipsis in language that opens when the connection between this and that keeps dropping, when the governing rules of grammar are broken and the subject cannot be fixed forever. In this metamorphic world, pronouns are as suspicious as ghosts. Their abstract open forms are susceptible to all sorts of haunting, to spirit possession or corporate occupation. It's the nature of pronouns, even their special virtue, of course, to be nonspecific and adaptable. But in Tutuola's text, pronouns are more than just empty grammatical vessels that absorb whatever nominal content stands closest to them. Rather, the pronominal condition is itself a mode of being, a mode of existence that follows a logic of transformation and transfiguration, of partial presence and incomplete possession. As Ashil Mbembe has written, in Tutuola's universe, the self appears not as an entity created once and for all. This is why there is no sovereignty of the subject, he continues, no subject but a wandering one. Indeed, to survive the pronominal perversity of the Tutuolan universe, the drinkard must be alive to the subtlest morphological inflections of language, thought, and being. As these skulls were chasing me about in the forest, they were rolling on the ground like large stones and also humming with terrible noise. But when I saw that they had nearly caught me, or if I continued to run away like that, no doubt they would catch me sooner, then I changed the lady, his future wife, to a kitten and put her inside my pocket and changed myself to a very small bird that I could describe as a sparrow in the English language. Suspended between the English of colonialism and an unnamed native vernacular, Words capture only approximately the reality to which they now refer indirectly, detoured through improper names, incomplete translations, and shape-shifting pronouns. To evade the ever-changing threats of pronominal imposters and other impersonators, the drinker draws on his juju of linguistic maneuvers and escape clauses, not only to slip away from, the personified, from personified death, but in fact here to slip the net of language itself. The terrifying gap between pers the personal pronoun and its referent in Tutuola's world is similar to the dispiriting legal split between the human and the person that Karl Marx saw instituted with the revolutions of the 18th century and legislated in the very, in the very title of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. The modern bourgeois rights regime, Marx argued, bifurcated and reduced man on the one hand to a member of civil society, to an egoistic independent individual, and on the other hand, to a citizen, a juridical person. In the wake of that split, the ultimate aspiration of international human rights law would seem to be the filling in of the chasm between man and citizen, left gaping since 1789, in Esposito's words to rectify the prior rupture between the human and its juridical pronoun. Such a task is figurative, or more precisely, it is disfigurative. It in fact amounts to killing the foundational metaphor between man and citizen that sits at the bottom of human rights law, the enabling analogy that nonetheless divides the human from its, pronom from, from its pronominal person. 
Historically, the legal category of the person precedes the human of human rights. Juridically, the personal pronoun carries certain rights and duties that precede any particular individual that await activation in the human. The person of international human rights law, not a really man in Tutuola's terms, holds the place of a human to come. Such a project entails the disfigurement of the person, the unmaking of our own images that resembled us too much. In the palm wine drinkard's most famous episode, the gap between pronoun and referent is filled in by a meticulous narrative account of personification. Tutuola resuscitates a dead English metaphor of the complete gentleman, a curious creature that in Tutuola's world is composed of rented body parts and comes from the land of the skulls. Tutuola's beautiful and terrible creature appears in the marketplace, dressed in the, most, in the finest and most costly clothes, with all of the parts of his body completed. The daughter of the head of that town becomes fascinated by the unknown man's full-bodied full beauty. Falling under the spell of his perfect figure, she tracks him into the bush, where she witnesses his disfigurement. The complete gentleman in the market began to return the hired parts of his body to the owners, and he was paying them the rentage money. When he reached where he hired the left foot, he pulled it out, he gave it to the owner, and paid him. Horrified, but still entranced, the beautiful lady goes a bit too far. This complete gentleman was reduced to a head, and when they reached where he hired the skin and flesh which covered the head, he returned them and paid to the owner. Now the complete gentleman in the market reduced to a skull, and this lady remained with only skull. The lady is now permanently transfixed. He tied a single cowrie on the neck of this lady with a kind of rope. Then he gave her a large frog on which she sat as a stool, and she became dumb at the same moment. With the aid of his native juju, our narrator will miraculously liberate her from this terrible creature and from her dehumanized state, frozen speechless on a toadstool. Tutuola was not the first person to put this story into writing. There are prior oral versions, translated and compiled in numerous collections of West African folklore by European ethnologists and missionaries in the late 19th century. In those variants, the open-ended nature of the allegory is foreclosed by the Victorian moralists who appended a clear didactic message to the tale. That lesson is directed generally at daughters inclined to disobey their fathers and marry men for impractical personal reasons. Such moral messages seem to confirm the common colonial view of primitive mythology, that such tales serve to transmit and justify the customary laws of man and the physical laws of nature. However, such a view also tends to slip very easily into old colonialist binaries of ethnocultural difference, like those found in the introduction to this anthology. In the fables of the world, wrote Scottish historian and folklorist Andrew Lang, speaking animals, human in all but outward aspect, are the characters. The fashion is universal among savages. There could be no such fashion if fables had originated among civilized human beings. We find this crude colonial attitude also repeated in the earliest reviews of Tutuola's drunken narrative, in which the infantile, irrational fantasies of the author are said to perplex or to delight the literal minds of sophisticated readers. Writing for The New Yorker, British novelist Anthony West appreciated Tutuola's freakish writing for giving us direct access to the primitive mind, a glimpse of what he called the very beginnings of literature when writing at last seizes and pins down the myths and legends of an an-alphabetic culture. Some saw the novel as a spur to regenerate the stylistics of an, of an exhausted literary European modernism, the textual equivalent of the African masks that had both disgusted and, insp and inspired Picasso and changed the course of modern European art. Such literary luminaries as Dylan Thomas, V.S. Pritchett, and Kingsley Amos were generally enthusiastic about Tutuola's story and style. Thomas famously hailed it as a bewitching story written in young English by a West African. The palm wine drinkard was a primitive relief. Only a dullard who has buried his childhood under several mountains of best-selling prose, one reviewer wrote, could fail to respond to Tutuola's naive poetry. If this curious novel seemed somehow beautiful in the Western literary marketplace, however, it was widely regarded as an abomination at home at the time. 
Few West African readers then showed any enthusiasm, either for Tutuola's writing or for its patronizing welcome in Europe and America. Babasola Johnson, for instance, disparaged Tutuola's English fluency, his literary skill, and creativity. The language in which it's written, he insisted, is foreign to West Africans and English people, or anybody for that matter. And he alleged that the author simply translated Yoruba ideas into English in almost the same sequence as they occur to his mind, and often with incorrect and too literal translations. These critics objected that Tutuola's writing was an example of embarrassing semi-literacy. Tutuola does indeed write in a language that is foreign to anybody, to use Johnson's accidental phrase. He writes from a place of imperfect fluency, a half bilingual, half bicultural space where the ordinary rules of language are suspended, where idiomatic figures of speech that once have must struck their first speakers as quite extraordinary become unusual once again. In this interlinguistic space of multiple overlapping half-literacies, euphemisms lose their euphemistic character as they move from one language to another, and literal language appears metaphorical. The material world vanishes into figures of speech, while dead metaphors in a second language return to life to haunt their native speakers. The essential figurativity of language, ordinarily hidden beneath the, or, the daily accretions of habitual usage, erupts to become visible once again. What is particularly interesting to me about this space between languages and traditions is that international human rights law itself emerges from a similar no man's land, an interlinguistic space that is also foreign to anybody, where we might say everyone is a half literate in the interlanguage of international law. Because it cannot be reduced to a single authoritative language, there is no single authoritative text of international law. Indeed, for all practical intents and purposes, international human rights law appears to us in one or more of the six official languages of the UN, all which have equal authority, are equally authentic. However, the fundamental principles of that law exist only relationally or dialogically or intertextually, suspended in the interstitial space between the six languages, whose cultural vocabularies, idiomatic expressions, and conceptual resources are not entirely commensurate or compatible. The interlinguistic condition of international human rights law means that we are only ever looking at an incomplete and imperfect translation of an otherwise inarticulable law. In a sense, then, international law in its perhaps platonic interlinguistic form remains a kind of unwritten natural law. Tutuola's novel cannot, of course, give, give us access to or make sensible this interlanguage of international human rights law. But it can, I think, give us a feel for its strange texture and the kinds of figurative transformations and deformations that emerge from the uncertain processes of translation by which human rights ideals are distributed among the various languages of the world. Tutuola's Complete Gentleman is a curious blend of a traditional Yoruba folk villain and a polite figure of speech that parades about an English, English conversation as if he were himself a real human being. Tutuola gives new life to the dead English metaphor by materializing the figurative process of personification in his account of the assembly of the full-bodied gentleman along a Fordist production line. The complete gentleman in the market is communally constructed and maintained by the whole people of that town, who are not only the lenders of, its, of body parts, but also joint stockholders in the bourgeois market fiction of the complete gentleman, as Roland Barthes might have said. The process and effects of Skull's personification reveals something about the peculiar pronominal aspects of the poetic figure of the legal person and its tendency to burst the boundaries of the human. The excellence of the complete gentleman's perfection endows him with qualities and capacities that far exceed the merely human. Indeed, the gentleman's perfect figure is so striking that the palm wine drinker in contrast to the earlier versions, actually empathizes with the woman's predicament. If I were a lady, no doubt I would follow him to wherever he would go. And still, as I was a man, I would jealous him more than that. Because if this gentleman went to the battlefield, surely enemy would not kill him or capture him. And if bombers saw him in a town which was to be bombed, they would not throw bombs on his presence. And if they did throw it, the bomb itself would not explode until this gentleman would leave that town because of his beauty. 
The full-bodied gentleman's figural perfection gives him competitive advantages in the marriage and commodity markets, but it also affords him special immunity from human violence and death. It provides both humanitarian shelter and a form of immortality. Indeed, Tutuola's complete gentleman has all of the graces of the human being in superabundance without its vulnerabilities. That is, he has the social, economic, and aesthetic advantages of the human without the disadvantages of its temporal, physical form. Human license, we might say, without, with limited liability. In fact, this artificial person acts like a proto-corporation. Assuming the, Im the beautiful image of the human enables Skull to participate in the commodity economy from beyond the grave. Like Tutuola's complete gentleman, the modern idea of the corporate person similarly, similarly emerged as a creative response to death, to forestall the fatal consequences of death wandering the world, perhaps even to a human desire to commodify and sell one's own death. As William Blackstone, uh, as William Blackstone himself, himself a man of parts and elegant tastes, according to the biography that precedes the commentaries on the laws of England, all personal rights die with the person. Thus, he continued, it has been found necessary when it is for the advantage of the public to have any particular rights kept on foot and continued to constitute artificial persons who may maintain a perpetual succession and enjoy a kind of legal immortality. The poetic parallel with Tutuola is almost too neat. In Blackstone's account, trans individual rights enter the world on the feet of artificial persons. The pronominal person then is a legal vehicle for keeping afoot certain rights that we think should not vanish, rights that would otherwise vanish with the human. In other words, human rights. From this perspective, the human is simply another personification of rights one curious creature among others who might occupy the pronominal position in relation to legal predica predicates intended to outlive their antecedent individual human subjects. If Tutuola's novel can be said to be thinking about the pronominal problem of personhood in its own idiosyncratic interlanguage, then the analytical texts of the legal theorists can be said to be thinking about the legal problems of poetry especially if we number the legislator among the poets of the world. Let me return to the last rose of summer for just a moment before offering some concluding thoughts on pronominality and the interlanguage of international law. Drums beaten to death, complete gentlemen who assemble, themsel assemble themselves from other men of parts, rites that walk on borrowed feet and roses that pine, these are the sorts of personification that the Victorian art critic and social commentator John Ruskin famously derided as the pathetic fallacy, the failure to distinguish, he said, the ordinary, proper, and true appearance of things from the extraordinary or false appearances. For Ruskin, the pathetic fallacy is a trait not of primitive mythology, but of second-rate poetry, caused by an excited state of feelings and, a mor and morbid poetic sensibilities, he said. Ruskin contrasts the sober mind of the mature poet with the inebriated temperament of a weak or a young one who writes, he says, under the influence of emotion or contemplative fancy, who views the world, we might say, as a drinkard. Legal critiques of the doctrines of juridical personality often repeated Ruskin's dismissal of, of something like poets too weak to deal fully with what, it is bef what is before them or upon them and who propagate false appearances. In both cases, the poet and the legislator are criticized for attributing human qualities to non-human creatures, for pushing the imagination beyond a point in Ruskin's words that is inhuman and monstrous, where all feverish and wild fancy becomes just and true. Perhaps then, it is second order poets who are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, or the legislators of the world are themselves only poets of the second order. Tutuola's novel is filled with personifications of natural phenomena and abstract principles that borrow their artificial life forms by way of analogy to the human being. So too are the legal commentaries on juridical personality and corporate personhood filled with personifications that take on lives of their own. In The Palm Wine Drinkard, these personified forms acquire human characteristics that often exceed the ordinary limitations of human cap capabilities and threaten the lives and liberties of their creators. At one level, 
What Tutuola narrates is the perverse, maybe even the primordial birth of the corporate person, which not only secured sovereign rights over the territory in which Tutuola was born through the Royal Niger Company, long before the native really men did, but which continues in our world to use the vehicle of the person to cheat death, to participate in the social world of human affairs, and to outcompete human beings for their human rights and natural resources. At a metacritical level, the tale of the complete gentleman is a warning about the risks of the pathetic fallacy, the threat posed by personification when its figurative effects are taken literally, the dangers of mistaking pronominal legal fictions for social facts or of dismissing social facts as mere legal fictions. We tend to take it for granted, especially when it comes to international human rights law, that the legal person is modeled on the, modeled on the human, that personification attributes human qualities to non-humans. But something peculiar and telling happens in that figurative process that ought to alert us to other operations. The pronominal person never stays within the bounds of the human. The poetic power of personification always exceeds the prosaic limits of the human, making the non-human, and sometimes the human itself, more than human, making it, in some ways, superhuman. As a juju man who knows all the kinds of people in the market, the palm wine drinker immediately recognizes the fraudulent, full-bodied person among the crowd of ordinary really men. Without the advantage of his magical insight, the whole people of that town are duped by the anthropomorphic deception of the complete gentleman. Magical insight, is of, of this sort, magical insight of the sort that the palm wine drinker possesses is clearly an advantage in a world suspended between languages and cultures. It is a special kind of literacy, the ability to read the grammatical rules that govern the particular interlanguage of, the, of this colonial frontier. As I've suggested, Tutuola's novel may not be able to give us such magical insight into the interlanguage of international human rights law. However, one basic insight to draw from reading The Palm Wine Drinker at the interface of legal and literary studies may simply be that it's far easier to recognize metaphorical thinking in the language or discipline or field of others than it is to recognize it in our own. In other words, the euphemistic metaphorical character of all language perhaps becomes most apparent when tropes wander, when, like the complete gentleman, long settled figures of speech, figures that no longer appear figurative at home, begin to cross into other languages, cultural realms, territories of knowledge, or academic disciplines. From a comparative perspective, or an interdisciplinary perspective, nothing could be more literal minded than Tutuola's version of the complete gentleman's making and unmaking and nothing could be more fantastical than the figurative ways in which certain rights and duties generally associated with human beings are attached to non-humans through the pronominal figure of the legal person. Thank you. So we have, we have some time for questions, uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Perfect. But we do need some questions in order to advance. The first one should be, what's that? That's Tutuola's own handwriting at the end of his manuscript in 1952 when he sent it to the missionary presses, um, claiming his own copyright. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I thought it really spoke to contemporary stuff around anthropomorphism and animism and sort of the ontological turn where we're continually thinking about the consequences and also the necessities of humanizing non-humans. And I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the superhuman and the more than human character because there's something that really rings very true about that, that when we anthropomorphize an other, it's human, but it doesn't have the negative aspects of humans. And so I'm just thinking if you could say a little bit more about how that works in your analysis. Please. Thank you for the question. I'm not sure that I can say more about how it works. I think that one of the things that jumps out at me, jumped out at me when I was working with this material again in the last six weeks or so um, was precisely that problem, which is that 
every single personification, every single anthropomorphism, no matter whether it's poetic, whether it's the last rose of summer, whether it's the, whether it's the complete gentleman here, or whether it's the law of corporations or something like that, always adds something that is beyond the human, right? So um, my, what, I'm, what I would be interested in trying to think about there is what happens when we use the category of person to, 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 for the human itself. Um, does it add, are, is the part of the problem that we already have a kind of legal system that has the idea of the person that is an added creature and a superhuman creature that the human cannot ever, ever fulfill in any case. Um, and so it's something about that figurative process that itself, I don't know what repository it quite draws on to pull those additive things to it, but I actually think it's really worth thinking about, not just in the case of things like corporations, but in the, thing, in the, in the ways we do all sorts of other kinds of personification. Um, so it's not as, I don't have a specific like, quite response, I think, to, what you, to your question. Thanks, Joey, for that uh, amazing talk. I'm just trying to make sense of it, but I'm thinking about whether the body of Christ has anything to do with this in the sense of the kind of figuration of the metaphorical person and the way that stories about corporate identity may or may not relate to the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose it's a pretty incoherent question, but part of the question would be about the body Mm -hmm. And part of the question would be about the Christian body of Christ mm -hmm. and that kind of early metaphorical thinking about the body that comes into both person and human. Mm -hmm. I think that so um, in in saying that the person itself, that person as a category, is itself pronominal. That is that um, we tend to use the word person. Like Agamben uses the word person. He's got he's got a singular genealogy of the of the word person, as Posito does too. It's an absolutely singular genealogy. His is the Catholic. His is the Catholic personhood, right? Category of personhood. And so when he sees the term turning up in other locations, he sees it through that lens. As when when he when he works with his analysis. So instead of trying to stop and say. You can do this really long, really important history of talking, the absolutely important history, right, of talking about the interrelationship between the Catholic, do Catholic doctrine about the body and the body of Christ and the three persons of God, right? Um, and you can get to something like how we end up with a certain idea of corporation within, European, within a European legal system. Um, you can do that on the one hand, but you can also then do a Marxist ac account of um, bourgeois individualism that gives us a different kind of person, right? And so I think that's right. I think that um, when you're looking at something like, um, w when you're looking at some of the, 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 the European history of that, it is very much tied up, obviously, with things like the church, things like the, the, the universities, the first corporations, right? Um, which are trying to work out a doctrine of the body that is based on, I think, a religious, that is based primarily on a religious doctrine. But I also think that when we do that, we tend to lose sight of all these other kinds of, the, all these other kinds of possibilities. And so uh, what I would find it really interesting to figure out how to theorize how you might theorize the person from the particular interface that I'm looking at here, right, where majors and ghosts are talking to each other in the, you know, in the, in, in the field in Nigeria. Um, and does that get us somewhere, do, would that get us somewhere else? Um, or is that already a history that has been overwashed and, and um, is already part of the international legal history, but we don't actually pay attention to it or notice it because we have to go back to the Catholic Church? Okay, third question. So in the uh, field of international law or domestic law, it's full of uh, entities, juristic uh, persons. Uh, no, the country is an uh, entity, uh, WTO is another entity, and just so many United Nations. So there is an internal structure to these entities. And that internal structure is really modeled on you know, a human being in some sort of ways. Um, to give you just, uh, um, you, know, you can say there's a trinity st structure, right? There's the executive part, there is a, a lawmaking part, the parliament, and there is a judicial part. But of course, uh, 
to incorporate different parts, uh, organizing the relationships among these three executive um, parliamentary, uh, legislative, and uh, judicial. Is this uh, a constitutive document the, you know, um, in the nation state is the constitution in the United Nations? Is the United Nations uh, um, no, uh, funding documents. So in order to understand the, um, the rights of such entities, either a United Nations or a nation state or a person, you have to understand a lot of interrelationships by analyze, analyzing uh, texts, you know, constitution, statutes, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I just think I'm just trying to figure out how your um, you know, kind of interdisciplinary study can benefit the study of international law in this f in this field full of entities. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, um, just a, a thought. Yes. Yeah, so um, the the version of international legal personhood that you've just provided, right, is the top down overall overarching one that the international space is, is um, even, uh, that it produces through constitutional mechanisms or internal documents, right, the particular forms and limits of a particular kind of personhood, and it's certainly the one that the UN likes to tell itself. Um, the, what I'm interested in thinking about here, actually, is that couldn't account for things like the Royal Niger Company on the, on, the, on the delta of, Niger, of Nigeria in the, in the late 19th century, which managed to exceed its legal personhood capacities that were granted to it by its charter in its charter form by going about and getting natives to attest that they have the sovereignty that they can grant to that, that, to that charter company, right? So that can't, the, what, the version that you've just given can't account for other forms of persons that have emerged that have maybe threatened the international structure that, you're that, that, that you've described, right? Um, or maybe have set up, have, have created their own international structures that are in opposition to or taking advantage of the kind of international structure you've, you've described. So I'm interested in trying to figure out where some of, these, some of these places, right? This is just one example, where you see a kind of international legal personality that has actually effectively emerged that the international legal system itself then subsequently needed to respond to. So in the case of Nigeria, the British come in and say, we're revoking the charter, right? You're too much, you're too much of a sovereign. You're too much, your, your internet, one way to read that is your international legal personality is threatening to the British, uh, British state um, in some fashion. And so I think that that's, there are, there, there are gaps that I think that um, we, need to, we need to explore, right? I don't know if that, if you feel like that responds to the question, but thank you. So I have a question. Uh, it's, it's something you said at the end, uh, you said that one of the reasons we might want to read this novel um, against international human rights law is to understand somehow the metaphorical grounds of our, our, our own field. Um, and that makes sense, but there was a, a sort of tonal, I'm going to use the word slippage because you, you used it too, there was a tonal slippage when you, between talking about the novel mm -hmm. and talking about international human rights law, and it went something like this. Uh, as we would expect, uh, an unstable person would be a thing to celebrate in the novel, mm. um, especially the modernist novel. And, and, and I had a question about where this novel is sort of situated himself in that tradition, but that's not the question I want to ask. Uh, whereas with law, we'd be less inclined to do that for some of the reasons that you gave. In fact, you mm -hmm. used the word slippage mm -hmm. when you describe what happened with the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And I took, I, I read slippage pejoratively, I have to say in that moment. I couldn't imagine you saying something like that about the novel, however, where, where we'd, be, we'd be engaged in a celebration of that slippage. Right, so, um, well, there are a couple of things there, I would say. One is that um, after I had started working on this, this book and thinking about it in relationship to questions of international law, I only subsequently discovered that Ashil Mbembe had written a piece in or the early 2000s on Tutuola that he published in Research in, Research in African Literatures, which is a celebration precisely of the kind of 
unstable, and one of the, one of the lines, I, um, I say his name, but then the next sentence is also a quote from him that I didn't acknowledge in the talk, part, the talk version of this, but um, that, that he actually is trying to figure out how, you, how this novel gives us an alternative understanding of the subject um, that do, it doesn't require the idea of sovereignty as self-sameness, as, um, as, as self-direction, as um, any of the kind of ordinary things that we think about, right? So he actually is trying to find a space for, for, for celebration. I'm not sure I would read the novel that way. I mean, I celebrate the novel, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure that I would read the kind of um, personhood that you actually experience through the novel. It's terrifying. It is terrifying, right? I'm in, that um, the kind of world that he has to that he has to deal with at every second, and the fact that anything can turn against him and anything can destroy him, um, means that that phenomenality, that that logic of phenomenality, is absolutely terrifying. So I do think that when we think about when we frame the problem of um, of, inter of international law or international human rights law in particular as a problem of repairing a split that goes back to 1789, right? which is a way that, that lots of people like to do, or Hannah Arendt and you know, I do it, and um, Marx does it, and Etienne Balibar, and, and, and um, Roberto Esposito, and lots of us, right? Um, when, we frame it that, when we frame it that way, what we framed it as is as a terrifying, as a terrifying project. Um, and I think it's worth recognizing some of that, that in that framing, which might not be the right framing, which might not be the right way to understand what happened in 1789, um, but framing it that way should be understood as, as, terif as terrifying a thing as I think Tutuola's, Tutuola's Bush of Ghosts in some ways. So it's the, the question of celebration there, it's not the question, it's not, I'm not, it's not some, it's not a kind of postmodern, post-human celebration of, you know, instability and uncertainty, right, or partiality and, the, and, and these other kinds of things. I think you could, you could do that, but I'm not, I'm not wanting to do that with this. I'm wanting to try to show, actually, even at the grammatical level, how terrifying that this, this structure actually is in a certain way. Shall we? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. I, I'm wondering then, considering how the law is today, how much do you think historically the human being has got in terms of personhood from companies and vice versa companies has got from human beings? Because looking at how international law stands today, I feel like it's still much more in the, director, in the direction of the human being, like human rights law, et cetera, where there is no an equivalent international law of companies. Mm -hmm. It's still very domestic. Mm -hmm. So how much they got from each other and if, was it in any way beneficial? Thing. Well, so in the in the U.S. context, it's there's a pretty clear relationship between these two things. The Fourteenth Amendment that ends that ends slavery ended up being exactly the door through which corporations walked their walked their rights. So they used the they used the abolition of slavery as a way to gain a certain kind of personhood within the constitutional structure of, the, uh, of U.S. law. Um, and so, in the U.S. context, at least, we talk about it. As, you can talk about it as um, the corporation is modeled precisely on the human being. In fact, it's modeled on the emancipated slave um, in in a certain way. That's that that actually isn't as central a feature to corporate law as it should be in terms of the histories of uh, the histories of corporate law in the U.S. But it is there. Um, in the I don't know the European context or the British context itself well in the in, in those ways. But it seems to me, and there are other people in the room who could do this much better than me, but there's, it seems to me that um, there are very strong examples. So the, corp the charter companies on the west coast of Africa in the 19th century seem to me to have ripped a fabric in international legal space to acquire a kind of international legal personality that human beings will only come to occupy 60 years later or 70, 70 years later, that it's got certain kinds of features. So it's non-state, it's a non-state entity that is claiming rights on its own outside of the purview of the state. It's supranational, right, in, the, in, in, in those kinds of senses. Um, I'm not sure that means that there's a causal relationship between those things. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that argument. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out that there have been persons who have been things like human rights persons before that are not actually human beings. Um, and I think that maybe could help us think about what it is that we're doing, what it is we're doing now. I don't know what the answer is there, and I'm a comparative literature scholar, so I don't have to answer the practical question. 
Um, but I mean, I, I but I do think there's I, I do think it's valuable um, to try to open up those to try to open up those 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 slippages, those places where these things have have disappeared from the conversation, histories that have disappeared, in some sense. Fully, sorry, to fully process it, but I was wondering whether you could talk a bit more about um, the stakes of uh, what you're arguing. And um, I mean, I had one initial take, which may be too reductive, that um, that you're trying to um, shift the conversation f about the critique of human rights as as a question of representation and inclusion into a question that um, better grapples with um, the metamorphosis character of personhood, um, and which on the one hand is both um, therefore encountering the potential terror, um, on the other hand, um, maybe going back to the first question, encountering the possible um, possibilities, you know, which people have in recent years, um, you know, calling rivers persons and having human rights, I mean, those the, the sort of ecological potential of mm -hmm. the metamorphosis. So mm -hmm. whether that slippage is um, sometimes a problem, sometimes a solution, but whether you're trying to shift to, to that conversation and leave behind whatever the, the, um, the poverty of the conversation about is universe, universal human rights uh, representative and inclusive and is that notion of the human actually compens um, encompass all the kinds of humans we want to encompass and so on. Thank you for that, Vasuki. Um, it's um, the original impetus for this talk was actually an admonition to my own my own discipline um, and to literature people in particular who, um, but then anthropology and and history who all all who of whom in the nineteen excuse me in um, the mid two thousands decided that what we do in the humanities is human rights. So the president of the Modern Language Association in the U S said specifically that sentence. The president of the Anthropological, American Anthropological Association said almost that sentence, and the president of the American Historical Association, all in 2006, said this. I had been working on these questions for a while um, without a lot of people trying to think about these questions in, in their legal terms, often only in their humanistic human terms, right? That is, that he, what are human rights? What is the human? Who is the human? Who, who counts as a human? Who doesn't count as the human? And I found precisely that conversation really impossible. Right. I thought it took no account of what the what the what the law is doing, um, and I thought it really important to pull, to 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 step back and say, wait, actually, this is also a law of persons. It's not a law of humans. Right. Um, so we've got the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was supposed to be the International Declaration, but Rene Kassan at the last minute said, no, let's make it universal. You could have had the International Law of Persons, right? I mean, it could have been the International Declaration of Persons as opposed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in some fashion. I do think that matters because I do think that we still, um, one of the ways that, when I, the, the very first time I tried to give a reading of Tutuola with this, I think the last sentence was, the problem would be if we become, if we, like the lady in Tutuola's story, become fascinated with the human and lose sight of the juridical subject, right? Lose sight of the juridical pronoun that actually walks rights around in the world, um, to, use, to use Blackstone's, you know, um, image. So that is, for me, part of what's really, part of what I would hope to, to, to be pushing on is to um, opening that conversation or moving the conversation away from strictly being about the human, which I think gets us into all sorts of dead ends, actually, um, when uh, at least in a lot of the work that's done in literary studies, and in, I think it gets into dead ends. Okay, any further questions? Well, oh, my turn. No, I don't think it does avoid those problems, but it, but it, but it says that, those, that person is also part of the construction of the human, at least within the international legal regime, right? And so that um, we can't think that what we're doing is talking about a law of human, of, of hum, simply of humans, because the, the law as it was written, as it's, been, as it's been written, doesn't actually use the language. It's quite, I'm quite literal when I say that the human almost drops out completely. Out of the international, uh, out of the international legal documents, it's almost always person, and the human become, moves from being a being a noun at the beginning of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to occasionally being an adjective. 
the human person or the human being, but eventually the, the, those other, those other the, the noun part of it drops off, right? So it doesn't avoid those questions. I don't think it avoids those questions at all. But I think it reframes those, for me, it reframes those questions in a way that's more helpful to thinking about what the law is actually doing or ha has been doing. Okay, any final questions? It's like an auction, the final <laughs> bid from the audience. Um, well, uh, thank you, Joey, for that. Um, I'm tempted to describe this as a death-haunted lecture, but that seems too downbeat. So um, let me just thank you for that. that, that I mean, it, was, it, was, it was visually uh, arresting, and, and I think that the, the phrase I was looking for was sort of poetically charged, the sort of act of poetry itself. So we're very grateful for you for giving this uh, annual lecture, and thank can you. you join me in thanking Joey for this?